Sure did. <laughs> All of order the council meeting of the Gerhardt City Council for September 6, 2023. Is there any declaration of conflict of interest? No. Hearing none. Then we'll swear in our new police officer. <laughs> Chairman, yes, sir. <laughs> Raise your right hand, please. I, Jeremiah Mars. I, Jeremiah Mars. Do solemnly swear that I will support. Do solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States. The State of Oregon. The state of Oregon. And the laws of the City of Gerhardt. The laws of the City of Gerhardt. And that I will do the best of my ability. That I will do to the best of my ability. Faithfully and honestly perform the duties. Faithfully and honestly perform the duties of police officer of the city of Gearhart. Police officer of the city of Gearhart. Oregon during my term of employment. Oregon during my term of employment. Congratulations. Thank Welcome you. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> and councils, just so that you understand, uh, uh, Jeremiah has been a volunteer firefighter with uh, Warrington. Apparently, he's made some friends over there. <laughs> yeah, this is Chief Alsbury right there from Warrington, one of our partners in firefighting around here, along with all these other folks here. And then we also have, uh, I think we have some Clutton County Sheriff deputy also here as well. Uh, and so, the word is off. Oh, yeah, we say Columbia County as well. Yeah. Okay, Columbia County Sheriff's Office. Yeah. And, you know, one of the most, the neat things about, you know, the work that bringing Jeremiah in and, and bringing uh, Josh in is, is this, this group of people now that we have that are, you know, looking at Gearheart, interested in Gearheart, helping us out when they can, and they have, as they have been uh, throughout. That includes Warrington Fire and all the police departments around here. So we're very excited about having both of you here uh, and starting with us. And thank you very much for sticking with it and uh, being part of Gearheart. Thank you for having so, me. I'm super excited. All right, it's great. All right. All right. So, one more picture on my phone. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Everybody smile. Uh, look at you. Yes, yes. <laughs> Jeremiah, can I bother you guys one more time? Yeah. Yeah, can we take a oh, picture absolutely. of everybody and the family too, some from somebody so we can put a bottle off? Absolutely. Oh no, please keep it. Well, yeah, please keep it there. Okay. No. Okay. Okay. Right there. Oh, oh Yes, yes, yes. Oh, 
Then everybody that's Yuri. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you everybody for coming out. I, I really appreciate the support. I hope I do well in this job. You will. We hope so too. <laughs>
and what they didn't know was House Bill 2605 was going to um, say that the state or was going to tell them that they, the state was going to have significant oversight in, to ensure that their engineering uh, was robust enough in the area that they wanted to build, and it was not. And so it's adding about $6 million to their project just in soil prep due to the liquid that's not what I'm so anyway, I just wanted to to keep that could have you know some overlap into our project here. Some things to keep in mind. Um, military activities are um, reportedly going to increase in our area. Um, they're going to be prepping because if anything's going to happen in the foreseeable future, they see it happening in the Pacific. So that means that we might hear more going overhead. We might have more marine assault vehicles um, causing beach closer, closures. So it's something else to keep in mind. Chad and I met with uh, Justin Parker and Mike, Mike Simonson from the Oregon State Parks about a number of beach related issues focused a lot on improving beach enforcement, creating more cohesive multi-agency response to holidays in um, particular. They were uh, happy to report to us that they're trying to get some bathrooms built at the Delray Beach Access, and they understand that they're already going down the same road we are as far as needing more dumpsters and garbage in the future. Um, they might be willing to join in our campaign and help us grow our campaign that we did this year where they're advertising um, in you know, in Portland, hey, okay, if you come out to the beach, make sure that you're keeping it clean and um, taking out whatever you're taking in. So all of that is, there's gonna be another meeting in October. <laughs> and then finally, um, when I read the article about helping hands struggling, I reached out to Alan Evans and uh, <laughs> the week before, and uh, we are at some point going to have a cup of coffee. He said he needed to speak to the city council, and I told him to come in today. I don't know that I see anybody here uh, from his agency, but uh, something to keep in mind, uh, if we lose Alan Evans and helping hands, that was what we considered to be a, a portion of, of the puzzle solving, making sure that we didn't continue to have problems in our city. So something we should all be very concerned about. Um, so I, when I have more on that, I'll, I'll let you know. Sure. Uh, just to add to that, I read in the paper today that uh, um, the governor is coming up with enough money to float them through. They're taking new referrals and can float them through the end of this year at least. So that's just an update for that. Because I I was gonna come in and say, can we help them? Is there some way we can help them? So uh, it looks like a crisis has been averted on that for the time being. Um, I uh, met with our police chief um, to present some concerns, both my own and uh, some other Gerhardt residents. He was very generous with his time and spent about an hour with me and uh, took notes and answered questions. And um, it was, I really wanted to thank him for that. Uh, the uh, involuntary inventory um, for emergency supplies uh, that the community emergency response team is putting out has gone out with the water bills. Uh, the notice to, to do that um, questionnaire uh, and we'll also go out with water bills on stuff uh, in October as well. Yeah. yeah. So uh, it's a really quick, easy thing to respond to. Uh, and we'd really appreciate it if everybody could respond to it. Uh, that's it. Rita. Well, because we're going to have a report on the bench committee, I won't talk too much about that. I'll just say what I did individually. And I met with Chad several times this month about uh, the current, the benches that are currently there and the relationship or who owns them. They were put out by the Gerhardt Homeowners Association. So we're working on that. And then I spoke briefly with Tyler at the Oregon Shore Permitting Department to see what would be, uh, what would be needed to get a permit to put benches on the dunes near the ocean. So that was that. And then a couple months ago, we had a visit from Recology and they spoke about their rates and then they invited any of us that wanted to go on a little field trip 
to go, so I got to go on a ride along and in a dump truck, it was very exciting. <laughs> Every time they dump the thing, I, the whole thing shakes. And anyway, so I got to ride along in a dump truck. And back then, when they presented to the city council, they said that 33% of the Gearhart residences have side yard service, which means the person, the guy has to get out of his truck and then walk up and get the the uh, bins and then take them back and then dump them. So uh, the ride along was in uh, the Highlands, which is not technically part of Gearhart City, but it is on their Gearhart route. And I was amazed that at 75 to 80% of the pickups there were side yard and they were just flat. So they had to walk up, you know, these driveways at a real steep angle. Some of them had two and three bins that have to walk down empty bin and walk back up an empty bin. And the, then after the whole thing was over, I met with Dan Blue, the government and community relations manager for the Northern Oregon. And he said that in Gearhart, some of these drivers walk 10 miles a day going up and down hills and, and it was really informative. So he said, uh, Ms. Blue said that they might start soon charging uh, for the length of the, the the length that the driver has to go to pick up a bin, and I could see it because it was it was phenomenal. I spent most time just sitting in the truck looking while he was out running around picking up stuff. So anyway, uh, that was it was a very informative thing. And if it, he said it's all, all city council, if you want to go for a great ride in the dump truck, give him a call because he's ready to show you. That was it for me. <laughs> you don't want to go for a ride and dump truck. It's very exciting. It's a garbage truck. It's a dump truck. It's a garbage truck. <laughs> well, it was very exciting. Business is picking up. <laughs> Preston? Nothing. Okay. <clears throat> we'll move on. Chief Gregory. Good evening. Um, I just want to start with you know, uh, Sergeant Brown, just so let everybody know Sergeant Brown is good now. There was a bit of an issue, but he's fully recovered and everything's good with him. So good. Just to give her a little peace of mind. Um, moving to Jeremiah, uh, very happy with Rez. He's doing a great job um, meeting all of my expectations, as he should this time. Plus, he's doing a great job. He's got a positive attitude. Um, his willingness to learn is evident. Um, he really has a drive to become a good police officer. He catches on quickly and makes rational decisions. Um, he's finished with LEDs. I actually put finishing up with LEDs, but he finished it this afternoon, which is basically required for him to be able to run people in, in a secure type environment. Um, so he's, he, yes, he's making steps as he should. We got a lot of good progress. Uh, he will begin, since he's done with LEDs, he will begin his field training process next week with Sergeant Brown. Uh, it will be a four to five phase, with each phase being five weeks. We talked about this before. Um, I'm hoping to have three phases done uh, before he leaves from the academy. He is set in stone now. There's no question. He has an academy date of 12-18. So he's going to go to the academy. There are a lot of breaks. I think we mentioned last where because it's during the holidays and they have an in-service program, program as well for sitting home. So we'll probably miss about three weeks out of the 16, so we can expect 19 weeks of training time through the academy. Uh, but the good news is he's he's headed that way. So uh, looking at August stats real quick, uh, we had one theft, uh, four trespasses, we got two DUIs, six disturbances, six animal related calls, one fraud, uh, 12 assist other agencies four alarm calls, seven suspicious circumstances calls, uh, 27 assists rendered to citizens. Traffic stats, uh, they were slower this month. We had, I had a lot going on in the office, uh, getting Jeremiah prepped up. He's been with me for this week's third week with me. So it's been a lot of administrative duties as well as Lex Cole, which I'll talk about in a second. Uh, but with, uh, over the month and with, with uh, Sergeant Brown being out too for about a week of it. Uh, we had 14 warnings, four citations, and we had three motor vehicle accidents. Two of them were injuries, and one was property. 
Uh, moving to Lexapol, I met with a project manager this week. He will be our dedicated project manager throughout the process to get our first three phases. Initially, we were agreed upon to do the first two of five uh, phases, but they were very nice and said, well, you're a small town. Uh, it should be pretty quick to do the third phase with you as well. So they threw that in there uh, as a courtesy. So we're very thankful for that. Uh, but I met with him and we were scheduling our meetings now every weekly. We're meeting on Wednesdays for two to three hours in the morning and we're going to hammer out policy. And so hopefully we can get that done by the end of the year, those first three tiers, and then I'll be able to finish the other two up. But it's just a positive note that it's moving forward and everything's going the way it should. Any questions? Amazing. We have a great clearance rate, it's not too. All right, Chief Como. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, a couple of quick stats from last month. Uh, August 2023 had 101 incidents for us. That broke down to 51 calls inside city limits and 41 uh, out in the district. We sent aid nine times for them, was to the Oregon State Fire Marshal's Office for wildland fires, mobilizations. Two was to Seaside One, building fire, and then one time uh, they needed extra manpower for a manpower intensive call. Cannon Beach uh, served for rescue, and then we went to a building fire in Hamlet and Astoria. We received aid five times, two of them was for fires in the dunes. And then we had a large uh, RV fire, which kind of spread to a wildland fire on the side of the highway that you can still see the burn scars you go. And while we were on that fire, there was two other medical calls that happened at the exact same time. So because we had the backfill of other apartments coming in, they went and filled uh, medical calls for that. How that compares, um, so July of this year had 114 calls, which included uh, July 4th at 35 calls just on July 4th. August didn't have one day that had 35 calls and it had 101 calls for the entire month of August. So August was extremely busy for us. Uh, August uh, of last year, there were 74 calls uh, for the month. So we obviously exceeded that by far for this year. And uh, last month we were 13 calls ahead of last year and now we're 40 calls ahead of last year for this now. So extremely busy with that. And then last month I asked you for extra funds for repair costs for our main apparatus. Uh, that's obviously back in service now. Uh, we asked for about, uh, we asked for up to $10,000 and the total cost was just under uh, $6,800. So we were $3,200 on the budget for that. So unless there's any other questions, that's the end of my report. Any? Thank you guys very much. Thank you, Chase. All right, master of money. <laughs> this woman had glowing reports from the um, auditors that were here. They could not believe how well organized and how fast she could find whatever it was they had questions about. This is master of money. <laughs> While the auditors were here, they um, had scheduled a day for their field work and they were here for about uh, four hours. And they had found no issues that we needed to address. I agree that with Carrie that they were very, very happy with our progress and thought we had made um, a lot of uh, really positive things. And they could find everything, and they were uh, easy to work with. They have until December to complete our report. Um, she thought maybe she would have a draft in the next week to me, so we may have it. Uh, in the next month, but they have until the end of December to get it done. Noteworthy in revenues, we've received a quarterly franchise fee payment for Spectrum, Spectrum Charter Communication and payments for the state for our liquor apportionment. A technology fee revenue account has been added to the general fund for fees charged for planning related services that are processed through our new business software, our building software, Acela. So Acela is a comprehensive for both building and planning. Um, when we put the budget together, we were thinking building because it was building software, but some of the things fall under planning, which is in the general fund. So we just added a revenue line item for that our whole $7 and everything. Uh, the city also receives an apportionment um, 
this last month for our state revenue sharing. So that money continues to grow and we will send those grant checks out by the end of September to the people who were rewarded. In expenditures, we have added account 10, 1061, fuel vehicle maintenance. Uh, this vehicle was previously used by the police department, but is no longer needed and transferred for city staff business usage. So traveling to meetings, conferences, workshops, code enforcement. Uh, the current charges to this account are for the removal of the official police markings. So obviously the police department um, no longer wanted it, so they no longer want the expense. So we moved it over to um, the administrative uh, fund. Uh, the police department has started their work with Lexapol, and we've charged that to 10, 12, 63 purchase services. There'll be another payment coming to them, but that, that's one invoice we received. During the processing of trying to organize our accounts, um, we, I didn't create a purchase service account for our fire department. And so as we're getting invoices, uh, we realized that with the way we had structured some of the things, we just didn't have an account for purchase services. So account 10, 1372 has been added. Uh, expenditures have been charged there. They also use Lexable, but at a different level and different, different services. Uh, they use it for fire procedures, policy manuals, and daily trainings. Uh, as well as a company called First Do, um, which is for incident training and reporting. So that was all put in purchase services this month. Uh, there was a payment in 10 beach access maintenance for services provided by the Clatsop County uh, Public Works. So the county had gone down there and done some work um, grading and taking care of the public access. And we have to share in that cost. So they sent us an invoice. Water rates were increased effective um, August 2nd, uh, which created a split rate billing for Route 2 properties. So people who received their um, August invoice, it was split with old rates and new rates. And we're hoping that this increase will assist with some financial stability within our operating fund. Just as a comparison note uh, for August water billing cycle, there was an increase um, of 1,718 consumption units or over 1.2 million gallons of water used by Gearheart Water Accounts compared to last August. So if I took August to August, uh, we used 1.2 million gallons more this year than last year. And in expenditures, Warrington's July water purchase amount increased over 30,000, which we expect and should anticipate when um, our consumers are using more water during the time year her purchases from Warrington. So it, it wasn't a matter of, I think, of price increases. I think it was just a matter of we just used more water during that period. That's it? That's it. Thank you, Justine. Peter Watts, city attorney. Yeah, a couple of things. Um, I, I I always try and keep you guys informed of federal litigation re, uh, related to the house's population. Um, in the past, the two, uh, well, the first case we focused on was the Boise, the Martin v. City of Boise case, and then the second one was the Grand Pass. Uh, there's a third case that is going up to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals that is very different and that is the city of San Francisco. Um, and they are taking, um, their position is basically that the shelter beds that they have are not being utilized because the people are refusing to utilize the shelter beds. They're insisting on uh, sleeping on the street. Um, there was a uh, federal judge in California that had prevented them from doing these sort of sweeps. Um, and they are applying a very significant amount of political pressure, uh, something that you really do not normally see in, in federal courts, including uh, the mayor um, holding a protest outside of the federal courthouse uh, because of their inability to manage their streets and the house's population. And so it is, in the past, the... Um, Arguably, the cases that have involved a jurisdiction that was trying to 
let's call it doing the wrong thing. In this case, they're saying if we don't have that sort of um, that sort of code, then we should have the special rules that allow us to regulate farm work. And so it's going to be really interesting to see what the panel uh, at the Ninth Circuit does with that. Um, and depending how they rule on that, that and the Grants Pass case together could go to the Supreme Court, uh, which would then, because um, there's a likelihood that the outcome of the San Francisco case will be very different than the, the other one just based on the facts. So that would then make whatever the rules are nationwide um, once it gets to the Supreme Court versus the nine Western states. Uh, and it's just that it's been, maybe it's because I'm a lawyer and I find these things are interesting, but it's been fascinating to watch as they kind of crafted these arguments uh, and, and make a pretty compelling case for um, enhanced ability to, uh, I'll just say police, um, where people sleep. Uh, the other thing that we have that they could impact us and, um, our development code is from the state legislature who keeps getting more and more prescriptive about our um, land use matters. And it's House Bill 2984 that allows the conversion of a commercial property into residential property. And it, what's interesting about this bill though is it does not apply to vacant commercial property. It just applies to commercial property that um, has a building on it. And then it is silent as to whether it is that building that would have to be converted or whether you can then use that, you can build the residential and the commercial zone at a higher density. Um, but what it also clarifies is you can't, cities can't make them add extra parking spots. So um, I think what they had in mind was a fail hall, but uh, what the way this thing's written is not narrow like a failed mall. And so um, it truly, we would have to, if someone wants to do that, we'd have to process say kind of a property by property basis. Uh, it's going to be really work intensive for our planner. But um, that's something that we uh, just, I want people to be aware of uh, because if we don't comply with the law, um, we could end up paying attorney's fees. And they haven't done a really good job of, of kind of rolling this out to cities so I could I could very easily see someone applying our code trying to do the right thing and then kind of getting caught up into this um into this uh this household. So that is what I have. Thank you, Peter. <clears throat> you ready, Chad? I am so thank you very much, Mayor Counselor. Uh, I did uh, have some conversations with Helping Hands today, verified some things that they are working on. They're very excited about the uh, the monies that they're getting into the helping the stop gap. They're also in communication, direct communication with the governor as well, who keeps assuring them that the process that they have, the monies that they've collected, eventually will get out and get out to uh, organizations such as them. Currently, they are putting together a uh, third bed unit in Seaside. They're still working on that, not quite developed yet. Um, we do have people that are looking for housing. Uh, we also they are feeding between sixty and eighty people a day. I can see side through helping hands. They've done a lot of good work um, lately and really helped us through our process. So uh, they're feeling quite positive about the things and we'll see that in the paper over the next couple days. I hope they're not today. Um, <clears throat> code enforcement, we've been uh, busy. We've closed a lot of cases, um, such as home occupation, signs, uh, vegetation. I just want to give you a quick kind of synopsis of what we're working on in code enforcement right now. We're working on a planting on the ridge path issue. Uh, that's that's being worked through. We're looking at uh, some electrical outlets that were uh, illegally installed uh, on public right of way, so we're working with that. Working on more noxious weed vegetation. We're sending out letters uh, pretty well daily, uh, over the last couple of days anyway. Uh, we're looking at five junk violations, mostly junk vehicles, junk cars, or things that are outside people's houses that shouldn't be. Advertising, um, we're, we're working on a flag issue, some sandwich signs, some, uh, some signs that are overly are too lit and creating some issues um, and a building sign uh, that has to be torn down and then they're working on putting it back up uh, as per our code. We're also working on a grading and fill permit that wasn't pulled, uh, so we're just kind of going through those paces and helping those people through that. 
We have a side yard building on R2 being used um, that uh, next to the C1 zone that we're working with. And then we have uh, two zone violations of unpermitted um, rentals, uh, that uh, long-term rentals in this particular instance because the uh, density is too high. So those are the cases that we're currently working on. Angelina's been very busy doing these. And uh, hopefully most of these will resolve without a court date, but uh, that may happen. Public works uh, water usage is, is uh, Ms. Justine was talking about. We are uh, a little up for the year, um, but we are pretty well right on what we did last year as far as the water goes, plus or minus about 400,000 gallons from the city of Warrington. So even though we spent about a million and a half more gallons of water this year, we only bought an additional half million gallons from the city of Warrington because Mark and the guys are really working hard on trying to get every drop of water we can with our current um, uh, allowances. And so that'll dovetail into some future projects for sure. We are still concerned about conservation. We'd still like to see people use some of those uh, automated uh, conservation landscaping. Landscaping seems to be the number one. We get a lot of surprise people with some really huge bills. A lot of these people are new to town as well. They didn't realize that this was happening on their property with their landscaping system. So we're really trying to encourage them, show them the system that we have here on the city hall and try to uh, get them to use that so that it will cut out for weather, rain, freezing and wind um, and monitor the weather rather than just going out through the rain. Public work staff will be starting to drive around earlier in the morning. So looking for our rainy days, people that are not lost. And then we're just gonna give them a note letting them know that that happened because they may not even know. We're still we're doing those sorts of things on the conservation side. And then also the public works guys will be doing some uh, annual valve exercising. They're gonna be taking the valves out for exercise to make sure that they're operating correctly. And they do that by twisting them open, twisting them closed over and over again. So you'll see them in your streets and your neighborhoods doing that. They're about, uh, I'm not sure how, are there on that project. Um, staff and administration, we're finished on the revised water ordinance for approval, and this includes some water rates uh, for installation fees. Uh, council goals in October, we'll work with the, uh, the mayor on getting that one back on track. And then also in October, the Seaside Water uh, Memorandum of Understanding, we hope of bringing that to you. Uh, so our agreements with Seaside will be solidified as well. Vacation rentals were down to 68, but lost one more. Uh, ODOT sidewalk, we've got the RFQs, the request for quotes out to four different organizations. And so we'll look forward to those coming back and the sidewalk project on um, Pacific Way uh, up near uh, Marion. And uh, that's just a repairable sidewalk. So you know that there's not um, anything new going in necessarily. And that is a grant that we received from the Department of Transportation for $100,000 which when we started the grant process, we thought that would give us quite a bit of sidewalk but uh, with the price change of things nowadays, it's shrinking a little bit. Um, we are uh, grants, uh, we've been still working with those. We're still working with the generator grant with the state of Oregon. We're, it's looking good though. Um, we have uh, received a Oregon Park and Recreation Department grant for $16,400 to look at the tennis slash pickleball courts. So we'll have more to report that. And uh, the county and the city is involved with the county on the $700,000 technical grant to redo our buildable lands inventories uh, within the county uh, in regards to housing. Last one of those in 2018, and that seems like it was 20 years ago now. Things have changed. A lot of the water usage that we see is a lot of uh, new people living in the town. I think we've all seen a lot of new neighbors. So there's a lot of those things that are going on here in this community. You see that the fire calls that we're getting, you see that in our police response and what they're working with. Uh, you see that in our water rates uh, that we're, we're trying to do. Things are much busier. The staff, is, is, as you see through all these reports, has been working very hard uh, lately. So we'll keep you informed on how that's going. Uh, in a landscape, did happen. We didn't have any uh, issues from that that had been reported to me anyway. It seemed to go pretty smooth. But people were very happy with that performance. And unfortunately, the Your Heart uh, Homeowners Association was not able to have a picnic due to that. Uh, I also wanted to remind the council, you may not know, but uh, last Sunday was the anniversary of uh, us losing uh, fire chief, assistant fire chief Bob Chisholm about 25 years ago. 
uh, he was lost on a call uh, when we were doing a water rescue. And uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, uh, he, he didn't make it. So I just want to let you know that this was the anniversary for that. Uh, the fire department did put up a good party uh, and a volleyball tournament in honor of him. And so we just want to let you know that I can take a moment to remember that. That's all I have, sir. All right. Thank you, Chad. Next, we go to the visitors section, and Steve Donovan's back <laughs> to confuse us, he oh. said. If it's possible, I'd like to get him, get Pete to, Peter to move over. Here. I'm going to need a computer open. I'm going to present a lot of data tonight. Um, we've got a PowerPoint presentation. You have, you've got it in your packet there. Are you going to be able to show that on the screen? We are. Uh, Ms. Christie, do you have that? Thank you. He has to join the meeting, and then he can share his screen. And I don't want to share uh, I'm, I'm not connected. He doesn't want to share this. Uh, oh, well, I, I'm not Do you happen to have the information, Christy? Do you have it, Christy? I do, but I got to dig, so give me a minute. Okay, gotcha. In the meantime, I'll uh, uh, do a little back fill here. We're here tonight not for you to make any decisions. Um, my, our singular hope tonight is to confuse you beyond recognition. So. <laughs> Hopefully we can get to that. Uh, what we talked about, and I mean, when we had city council or the open house, he said, let's not confuse people with conservation rates and a rate increase. We want to get the rate increase done, then we want to give people time to get educated on this before the conservation rates hit. You're absolutely right. So what we're thinking about doing is giving you a presentation tonight, hoping you can make a decision on this before Thanksgiving-ish, get the rates, conservation rates, if you choose them, in place by January. No customer's gonna be impacted because they don't use a lot of water in January. So there's not gonna be any, any conservation pricing. So you can have a high level of education between January and June when they start using water. So that gives you six months of, of, of customer education on this issue. And conservation-based water rates are not new. And they're actually the coin of the realm in the industry is what we do. So I think we're up now, Steve. We're all set? Okay, so I'll look you. There you go. Uh, if you can, are you going to run it? Ms. Christie is. Christie, when you run it, run it in the uh, uh, presentation mode, in the, the show mode, because we're going to have some graphics that are going to fly in, okay? So. Actually, all I have is a PDF. Oh, well, okay, well, that'll work, that'll work. My uh, uh, thunder will be taken though. <laughs> Go ahead, uh, let, let's, uh, I'll watch this with you. The reason I've got my computer open tonight is I think I know you folks, and the data that I see, that you're gonna see in that screen is gonna trigger questions. The first one's gonna come from Dana Gould. I'm pretty sure it'll come from her. Uh, what are we looking at? that is not shown on the screen. And that's why I've got the data here. So go ahead. So the first thing we're gonna do is talk about uh, data. So what we did is we went to your billing system and we collected all of the three quarter inch meters that were read between July and August of 2022. And that represented 722 individual meter reads. That's the time of year when people use a lot of water. And the most expensive water that you sell is called the max day. It's the maximum amount of water you sell on the hottest day of the year. And within that max day is max hour. That is the three times it costs you more to produce that water than average day of demand. So next we've got, uh, uh, hang on, go back. Christy, you wanna just go over some of the commercial things here. Uh, you know you read your meters bi-monthly, right? Everybody knows that this is an important issue here. You get billed for water every two months. Some cities do it monthly. You do it bi-monthly. Bi-monthly is not unusual. Uh, and the next thing I want to talk about, uh, we've eliminated from this commercial accounts and master meter accounts. A condominium might have 15, 20 units in it, but it'll have one water meter. So we've eliminated them. We're just looking at these single family three quarter inch meters. And we're gonna talk about a frequency distribution. 
and how we're going to present the data so that you can understand who uses the water. And that's all it really means is we took all those 722 accounts. We said, how many use one unit? How many use two? How many use three? And you're going to see a kind of a curve. So that's what the frequency distribution is. Go ahead. So what you see here is on the blue is what I just talked about, that frequency distribution. How many use one unit? How many use two? And as you can see, we broke it down into logical blocks. And what you'll see here is anything over 50, there were 96 counts out of those 277 that used over 50. That's a lot of water. Out of those 50, 20 used over 100. And out of those 20, two used over 200 units. That's the equivalent of 75,000 of gallon, 75, gallons of water in one month. Or to put it in lace terms, that's 11% of the water held in an Olympic-sized swimming pool, 50 meters long, 25 meters wide, two meters deep. That's an inordinate amount of water coming out of the three-quarter inch meter. Those are the customers, particularly on that back end of the curve that we want to send a signal to to use less water, and hence the pricing signal. So what you can see here in these blocks is the first block, zero to 10. And remember, in your pricing structure for every two months, I think, uh, Preston, you said you don't use that much water, so all you pay is the base charge every month, right? Very much. Yeah. So in other words, you use five units a month. You, in your billing cycle, you get 10 units included in your base charge. The consumption charge does not even start until you, you hit that 11 unit. So just kind of keep that in mind. The interesting thing to see here is uh, in that first block, 34% of all those 277 or 247 of those use 10 or less. So your community already is fairly conservation oriented. You know, we, we were talking a couple months ago about geez, all of these big yards, all this water. Yeah, there's some that do that, but the preponderance of your customers don't. And they don't need to have a, a price signal. And they're only just paying the base charge. In the second block, uh, 157 customers, or 22%. So now you can think about a bell curve. We're starting at 34%. Second block is 22%. Third block is 15 uh, Next block is 8%. Next block is 7 And then there's over 50 13%. We want to keep, we want to get their attention. So go ahead, next slide. So what happened is we saw those blocks. Now what we've done is we've created a, a frequency, di frequency distribution of the blocks. Remember the 247, the 157, the 108. And what we typically would do here now is that first block is they're not going to pay any volume charge and they're your largest group of customers in, in the summer. They're not going to be affected by whatever we do relative to consumption-based pricing because they don't pay for consumption. The next block, 11 through 20, that could be your base. We call it the base block. And that block would also not receive any penalty because that's really a fairly small block of customers and a reasonable amount of consumption. Relative to of the other blocks, it, it, it's not that they don't receive a penalty now because when they go beyond the ten, they are paying a higher price for the additional. Right. So, but, but you're not considering at this point uh, putting an additional an additional on fee on top of that. Yeah, good good point to clear. When you go over ten, you pay a, a volume charge of two dollars and seven two seventeen. Is it now seven forty one? Seven forty one. It's it's per 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 100 cubic feet. So think about that. That's your unit that we're going to start thinking about pricing. So what we could do based on this is you could produce the first block, 11 through 20, would be called your base block, and they would be charged the, your current rate of 714 per 100 cubic feet. Now we could start thinking about putting conservation pricing on those outer blocks. Go ahead, Christy. Here is just an example in the table that you see here of the, of the blocks that we've created. Uh, one base block and then four conservation pricing blocks. You'll notice the yellow here. I put in a, a factor 
a pricing factor. Now, as you can see in that base block, it's 1.0. So they're not being charged any penalty. The next block is 10%. The next block after that is 20%, 30%, 40%. Where do I get that from? I made it up. This is what has to come from you folks. There is no magic bullet on how do you price for conservation. And then later in this presentation, I'll show you what some other communities do. And it's all over the place. It's all over the map. Now, what I would suggest you consider, this being your first shot at, at conservation pricing, is try to come out with a, a, a gentler hand, as it were. Don't come out swinging an ax here. Possibly something in this range might make some sense. The next thing that we might want to consider is combining those blocks. Right now we've got, could you go back to the prior slide, Christy, please? There you go, thank you. We could combine these two blocks into block consumption block one, and then these two blocks in consumption block two. So you'd only have two penalty blocks. And we'll show that with what other communities do. That's your choice that you could do too. The only reason I did this is because it's pretty logical the way you build now. That first 10 is, is doesn't get any, any consumption charge to it. And the next 10, and if you think about it, the first two blocks represent almost 60, 56% of all the customers were observed in the first two blocks. So really, what we're really talking about is anything over 20 is 40% of, of, the, of the population. So we may not need this many blocks. The easy thing is her billing system can handle it. She did that it, the, the water billing system is already set up to do this. So there's no incremental software problem. And it's not unusual to have more blocks. The examples that I showed you didn't have four blocks, but I know many that do. So that's something that you might want to think about is how big do you want to cast your net for conservation pricing and how much do you want to charge for that conservation pricing? So as you can see, go ahead to the next slide. This is an example of, of the pricing that we could come up with. And as you can see, for those people that are using over 50, they're paying quite a quite a premium relative to people in that first block of seven dollars and forty one cents. They're paying ten dollars and thirty seven cents per hundred cubic feet versus the people in that first un, 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 I don't want to call it unpenalized, but unconservation block of seven dollars and forty one cents. So I want to just take a stop here. And do you see what I'm saying? Is this making sense to you based on your data? It's not based on some data that we made up. It's based on observed data from Gearhart in the summer of 2022. Right, it, it, it makes sense to me. And, and I don't know that it, what you're gonna get out of me is a question, <laughs> but I, I'll, I'll be happy to be the first one to, uh, to share an observation. I mean, you can tell me if, if I'm understanding you correctly. Sure. This is for clarification. So what you're saying is that um, the last time we talked, we needed more income, and you were here to help us solve that problem. Right. And now we need to reduce the amount of water that we're using, but we still need that income. Oh, no question. And then my no other question. concern are our businesses here in town. I don't want to. I'm, I'm wondering how how this is going to affect our businesses. And how many of those top tier people are people that? I mean, that is just part of running a business, and they're not really going to be able to conserve. So we're going to be. Well, I can answer that one right away. Okay. But I, let me let me continue. And then the other thing is, I don't want to put all of our landscapers out of town or out of business either. I don't want it to be so successful that we have folks out of it. So I want us to. It's very important to me that we do this scientifically and that we find the point of parity where we still make money and we don't run our businesses and our, our people that need to make money here out of town. Cool. Question one. The commercial customers. Commercial customers generally don't generate a peak. Okay. They don't do a lot of landscaping and irrigating. So they don't generate the peak. The residential class generates the peak, generates your costs. The reason you've got all this water storage and all, all why he's, he's almost going apoplectic trying to find more <laughs> supply, it's not because of the commercials, it's because of the residentials. 
So that's that's really that that problem will take care of itself because their their consumption is usually pretty predictable across the year. Uh, the next one, I completely agree with you. We can do this over time with a gentle hand and push behavior. We can do a slow, small conservation block pricing this year, come back next year and see how successful we were. How did we do? How did we get these guys over 50 and over 40 moving into over 20 and over 20? That's our goal here. We don't want to deny them water. We don't want to punish them. We want them to get into a lower block of water consumption. We don't want them to waste water. And anybody that's using 200 units of water over a two month period, they're pushing a lot of water on the grass. Gary, what do you think? Are we, are we, is this making sense to you what we want to do here? Steve, it makes all sorts of sense. And I, I would be more than happy to increase it just a little bit. I think water conservation is one of the big things we need to do. I go out and I see it the lawn being watered in the middle of a rainstorm yeah yeah you know it's just because people don't want to take the time to look at it and go no i don't need to water well your water's dirt cheap that's probably why it's so inexpensive here yeah yeah but the whole thing is uh, i imagine that the people that are in that in that higher bracket and everything like that probably you know i mean they're they're off island homeowners. Well, and you're right. You're right. And they don't know when they're, you know, it's like Ch Chad said. I mean, this thing he's got on the outside of City Hall here, which monitors what the weather's doing and everything like that, and then and then adjusts the sprinkler system. I mean, I've got a client that, you know, I mean, she keeps she. I mean, she she's best friends with Justine here because her bills are six hundred bucks a month. Well, right. yeah, you're right. And uh, we do the water rates in Mercer Island, Washington. And uh, they've got people there that are using 400 units every two months. And their bills are several thousand dollars. And they don't care because they're very, very rich. Yeah. And they just don't care. And we're going to get some of it. We're going to have a, a penalty block and a price. And they're going to continue to use that water. Uh, unless you got into a severe curtailment situation where you had to curtail them for some reason, that's the only reason they could stop. And that's okay. I mean, that's the price signal that we've got. We still live in a free society, right? We're just sending a price signal. So what I would suggest that you consider is just cogitate on this and talk about it about yourselves. Do you want four penalty or pricing conservation blocks that I've set out here? Or do you want to combine them and maybe just make two? Make it Anything from 20 to 30 and anything over 30 might be a nice starting point. Easy to understand or use this the number of blocks we've got. And then the pricing signal. There is no, go ahead, Christy, next slide. Here is now the comparison. So to your eyes, you can see the blocks that we've got. And then as you go consuming off the blocks, your price goes up. So that's what you might, might help your eye when you're thinking about this. As you get further and further out of the consumption curve, you pay more and more, and that's what you want to do. Uh, go ahead, Christy. Now this is, and it's in your packets, it should be a little more visible, I, I apologize here. These are uh, rates, uh, we did the exact same we're doing with you, we did last year, year and a half ago with the city of Malala because they were scratching their heads on the same thing. They wanted to put in conservation pricing. How do, how do they do it? So we put this together for them. Look at Aurora. They're bi-monthly, just like you. They have two blocks of conservation pricing uh, from uh, anything from 10 to 13, very small block is the first consumption block. And they, they, go, uh, they go from 70 cents to 75 cents. And then anything over 14, it's the penalty block, but they don't have a very high uh, penalty cost there. Uh, but look at the next one, uh, candy utility. Anything over 10, they get a 75% hit over the base. They, and they, I mean, they're, they're severe about 
concert, they want to give a strong signal to conserve. Uh, Hubbard, bi-monthly. Uh, once again, a uh, little, little more gracious. Uh, their base charge, they've got eight units in the base charge, much like you've got 10. So no concert, no, no uh, commodity charge. Then from 10 to 33 on a bi-monthly basis, they start at $3.15. Anything over 35, we saw that our block, our 30 block, they put in a 48% penalty. So they're, they put a severe block in there. They're all groundwater on their water supply, and they, they have curtailments sometimes in the summer. So they've got an incentive to conserve. So what we're really looking at here is, of these examples, uh, pretty much three blocks, two penalty blocks, one base block, is what these folks are doing. Doesn't say they, that you should. And the, the uh, penalty costs are just all over the place. Now, I don't think you need to be heavy handed starting out. I think you can be a softer touch. And then every year as you move on, if we make progress, we can, we can reevaluate that because we've got the map. But that's something that you should want to think about. So I'm going to take my leave here. And how many blocks do you want? Four or, or two or three, think of it that way. And then what do you want to, what do you want to price? And that's something that you're just gonna have to make an agreement upon because there is no magic bullet. You know, there is no American Waterworks Association uh, technical memo that says, here's the price you gotta pay. Am I correct in, in my belief is that if we were to have less blocks, it would be easier for the, the folks that are buying our water, using our water to understand and navigate, and there'd be less surprises for them. I, I think so, yeah. I, I think so. So simplifying it is, is in our consumer's best interest, I think. Mean, you know. Depends on what your goal is. If your goal is to get people to move closer toward 10, and you want to get people really less consumption so you buy less water from, from uh, your neighbors, uh, then you want more lots. If you, you're not worried too much about that and you really want to capture these guys on the back end, those guys over those 96 accounts that were over 50 that you really want to send a price signal to them, then do less. Thank you. Anyone else? All these were Deer Heart residents. We didn't, I mean, because you're just right. yours, just yours, right off of your billing system. Nothing in the palisades. Oh, no, the, anybody I, in the water. Yeah, anybody in our water district. So we could have some people hung up in the Highlands first. Yes, yes. We just gave them a straight billing cycle. Okay. Thank so, you, Steve. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, if you've got any questions, you know, give me a call. We'll, we'll talk through it. But I'd like to see you maybe come to some consensus this fall, so that if you make a decision to do this, she can be prepared to get it into the billing system. It shouldn't be that tough. Your point is so right on, is you've got to give lots of front end time, education to people. This is coming, this is coming. Next summer, the rates are going to have this conservation plateau to them. Be aware, because there's nothing worse than you send somebody a bill and say, oh, by the way, I raised your rates, but I forgot to tell you. Right. <laughs> Well, it just makes it easy on Justine because well, yeah, yeah, you yeah, have yeah. all these people coming down saying, I just got my water bill. What's up? Yeah. All right, folks, thanks. Appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Yeah. Next on the list is the Gerhardt Bench Committee progress update. That's me. You want to stand back here? Or go up here? And I think you had a presentation for Christy as well. Uh, yes, Christy, just want to go ahead and put the uh, slides back for those pictures of that. Would be great. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Kathy Zimmerman. I uh, haven't been here to speak to anybody ever. Probably should have at one time, but I didn't. Uh, nice to see you all. And I first want to start off by thanking um, Rita and Sharon. For contacting me and inviting me to be on bench committee. Um, wasn't quite sure that there was a bench committee. Um, first time I ever heard of it when 
was when a friend passed away uh, three years ago, Jim Furnish, and the family asked me to put his name on the um, waiting list, which I did, <clears throat> and I think uh, one of the gals up front put the name on. Um, I was not aware that this committee had been in existence since 1998. Uh, post 1990 was finally accepted and actualized 1999. The original bench um, was, excuse me, I don't have my glasses on, I'm having to look at you. Uh, no, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> if, I, if I put them on, I can't see there. So I'm trying to train my, there we go. Um, let me start up here. Um, a brief history. I'll read this real quick. I, I'm sorry I had to call Steve because he did an excellent job. Uh, this will be quick, though. I'll give a free, uh, brief history of each committee. Um, and I want to thank, first of all, uh, Candace Smith, who is the president of the uh, Earhart Homeowners Association. She provided a lot of history, uh, great suggestions, and good advice to the three of us. And um, we were able to go from there. Uh, and from what she gave us, uh, learn more about the um, Earhart Bench Committee. George Beals and Jim Gilbaugh, uh, who has been deceased at this time, were the original uh, creators of the concrete and ironwood bench. And I have a separate picture. Well, what you see up there, most of those are the original benches that were created um, prior to 1999. Um, and I do have some more pictures coming up with the folks. Uh, at that time, they had placed 10 benches already on the dunes and Leslie North Park. However, since then, there have been another 14 benches added. But over the last 24 years, there have been an additional 23 to 24 names added to the waiting list asking for a memorial bench to honor their loved ones. <clears throat> 24 years. It's been a long time people have been waiting for a memorial bench. And it's, I don't know why the committee has set in limbo as long as it has, but uh, we're here to get it out of limbo and make this happen. Right, girls? Please. Uh, hopefully our committee is both finally accomplished this task. Following is what uh, the bench committee has accomplished in accordance with the 2022 Parks and Recreation Master Plan, Section 313. One, we've had five meetings, including a meeting with Candace Smith, President of G, uh, GHA, and Chad Sweet, our, our city manager. We've identified and mapped the location of the existing memorial benches, which are 24 plus. We've identified and mapped new potential bench locations, which is another, I think, 23 locations we, we've uh, identified. Four, we have identified a bench which is appropriate for the dunes from a company in Canada that makes a similar cement rail bench like George and Jim originally created. And uh, if that isn't feasible, we've chosen an alternative style bench made of recycled plastic. Sharon is in contact with both these companies. Five, we have identified a bench that is appropriate and consistent in style with the current downtown T benches which you will see, uh, the first one actually is uh, with a teak bench. Um, and we also have identified a similar um, style that uh, is made of recycled plastic or polywood, which I'll put up pictures of that. Uh, Christy, you wanna go ahead and put those other pictures up we'll scroll through those. Okay, this is a teak bench that um, Chad, uh, found. It's in that box right there. I have oh, put it together yet. Okay. All right. Today. Great. And that is um, teak wood. And can you scroll down some more, Christy? This is a polywood bench, which is made of recycled plastic. And uh, driving up and down the coast, I've actually seen a lot of these. And I think Bob Murray was telling me that in uh, Balboa Island, is that right, Bob? They've, um, they've opted for these, these benches. Scroll down to the next one, please. Of course, this is Leslie Miller, Miller's uh, marble bench at the park. And next, this is the original bench. 
overlooking Little Beach, one of my favorite spots to sit. This bench is uh, like a few other benches out in the dunes. Uh, it's been neglected, uh, needs some repairs, and uh, the grass needs to be cut from around it. It's not the only one. This one has been refurbished, it so it sits below the park on Marion. Uh, just like the bench across the street from the courthouse here has been, been refurbished, restained. This is a downtown teak bench um, that would be, it doesn't need to be replaced, but if, if and when it does need to be, um, we can either use the teak replacement that Chad has in here, or there's another one that we have identified. Do you want to go ahead? This one right here. This is made of um, recycled plastic. And uh, it's a really solid looking bench. And that's another one also. Now we have gotten quotes on this, Sharon has. So uh, we still have some work to do on deciding exactly and city council, which uh, ones you would want to choose. Um, the sixth thing that we've done, we have called all 24 names on the waiting list. Uh, to get a current count of how many are still interested in commuting or uh, committing to a memorial bench. Out of the 23 call, we think possibly 18 to 20 have said yes, they would. I think I'm still waiting for one call back. And did all of yours call back? I, I have three, but I was at the top of the list, and those people have been waiting the longest, and some of them even for, had moved and forgot they were on the list. On the list yeah. So, so I'm, I didn't have as much luck as you two that had folks down the list. Yeah, yeah. exactly. I had one that had been waiting for 20 years and he was amazed. He said, really? <laughs> <laughs> we're delayed and forget about me. So uh, that's great. Uh, number seven thing that we have done, we did this create a, a commemorative bench, bench order uh, form for those on the waiting list who still want to memorial more bench. And Chad is to create an agreement showing the length of the contract and the dollar amount to be agreed upon between the donor and the city. Also stating that the bench belongs to the city, it is a tax deduction for the donor, and the Parks Department will maintain the bench um, and area it resides on. This will pre be presented to City Council for discussion and approval. And we have actually looked at Seaside's bench agreement that find it has been really helpful as a template for Gerhardt to use. Um, they have a, a pretty, I think, a nice agreement between uh, the city and the, those who are requesting Memorial Bench. Uh, number nine, Sharon has been communicating with several alternative bench companies upon information obtained from them. We will then fine tune our findings and present it to you, the city council. Ten, we are a committee. We, as a committee, are recommending three different styles per the parks and rec master plan, i.e. bench types to be pre-approved by the city council that will be allowed outright in any approved location. A, a rail and concrete, B, a teak bench, and C, polywood recycled plastic. In conclusion, the committee is in agreement that after these 18 to 24 donors who have been waiting are placed and satisfied, then we feel that we have met our cap concerning bench placements. Um, we should have plenty of inches in, in the city. Uh, future memorials are being considered in the form of tiles or bricks, possibly from the new city center park apartment is built, or possibly erecting a gazebo or a wall in Centennial Park. We are open to any discussion, feedback, or help. We'll be welcome when we hear our public. Thank you. And I think we looked at all of the, the pictures. It looks like we did. Thank you, Kathleen. Anyone have anything to say about that? Okay. A little bit to add. Um, also, I want to remember the donation done by Charlie Chuckshe. Uh, he did donate 20000 Well, his foundation, Charlie, had passed away. Brenda Shea is uh, helping him with his foundation. And they donated twenty thousand dollars, and those are the one of the benches that you had taken right. a picture of mm -hmm. that were refinished and they look fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. The intention is to get the rest of those benches out and done uh, as well. 
just finding the time with the contractors, but we have a couple of guys who know what they're doing. It'll take some time to get there. Also, with the bench waiting process, it really was with the city. There has been people, you know, I've been keeping the list since 2012. Um, the, the, in the documents, it was, and, and through Gearhart, it was, we will not have any more oceanfront benches. Many of the people uh, who wanted or were on the waiting list for benches wanted oceanfront, of course, because that's the most you can do. We have been able to get a few of the people off the, the bench list uh, between now and then with some of the extra benches that we put out to just the one across the street here from uh, City Hall. Uh, so just the one that is over at the uh, pickleball tennis court as well. And uh, I think that, that that's it. But this group has really done a lot of work to try to find some new areas for those benches. We'll be putting together some maps so that you can better understand that. And uh, I very much appreciate the volunteers. It's been great. And uh, one more thing, Rita, um, we found uh, the bench, uh, the two benches up on Pacific Lake um, and the ocean front. Originally, were placed on the dunes on each side of the path and had a view of the ocean. There is no view of the ocean on most of these benches. The ones that I I found, yeah, over on the uh, north side. Um, two or three of them do have ocean view, and we had talked about possibly moving those to the four dune. And I, did you talk to Josh? Uh, was it Josh or Taylor? I talked to Tyler, and he said what he said, and then our committee said wanted you to talk to Josh. Yes, yeah, so I have a message in to him to so have that conversation. What is he? He is asking for it is that an exact map of where all the locations are, okay. so that then you can come up and take a look at it. And just to let you know, what we were uh, trying to accomplish um, was to move those fences past where the dunes have accreted and created uh, a nice view of the backside of the dune now to try to get those back up on top. But that is out of our jurisdiction in regards to control on the beach. That is in the uh, uh, Oregon Park and Recreation Department's jurisdiction. They have concerns about putting memorial items out onto the dunes because if we start here in Gearhart, where do we end up in the rest of Oregon for this? Uh, and how do we start, you know, are there going to be memorials up and down for each of us moving forward? Because Gearhart is allowed to do it. So they need to take that back to some of the people that they're discussing, talk about some policy. I'm going to provide them with a map, and then we will have that additional meeting. And maybe that can get one, two, or both of you there as well. Now, they're not called memorial benches. They're called commemorative benches. <laughs> I'll give that a shot. Give that a shot because they're not going to all be in memory of somebody. They're going to be other things. Okay. If families can purchase these, uh, more than one family can come in and purchase a bench. It's just not relegated to you know, one yeah. family. Yeah. Uh, Chad and my friend Jack and I can share a bench and Preston. <laughs> <laughs> Have you guys ever considered maybe just up at Leslie Miller Park just putting up a, a plaque? With a bench in front of it, and for people that want to have their names on it, to use that same bench, and and we, you know, they can buy the plaque, public works can put it up there so that everybody can see who it is that they're trying to memorialize. Yeah, we talked about it like a memorial wall or um, a, a structure that they could put tiles on or put plaques on, whatever. But they were thinking more on Centennial Park. There, yeah, but either way. Well, that's I mean that's that's fine. The fact of the matter is, if you walk down on the beach or down to the benches on the ocean front, any day you'll find almost zero are being used. Mm -hmm. So by adding more, I mean, people have got all kinds of places to rest around this city. I see a lot of people using them. And we, a lot. Down on the beach? Yeah. And we've had people, because the, the trails from like the end of Pacific Way and the beach is long. Mm -hmm. And I've had people who we've discussed benches with said it'd be really nice to have a place to sit midway, right. you know, for our elderly people or people have who have mobility issues, and, you know, so or with children or for, yeah, with, with children. Right now. No, I think I'm hey, anybody that's complaining about children not being able to walk to the beach, you know, or not letting their children exercise enough. Okay. You know what? I'm gonna walk on the beach, and then you're gonna and then you're gonna say. I gotta sit down and take the sand out of my shoes. I go, <laughs> I go down, I go down, digging every single time. 
<laughs> and walk back. Well, good. Good for you. Good for you. <laughs> okay. And look at what it's done for you. position. And you just keep walking. But when you walk past me and I'm sitting on the bench, I'm not going to sit over. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so now we're moving over to the um, public comment section and no one signed up coming in. Does anyone want to speak? Because then I won't read the disclaimer here if nobody wants to speak. Good. All right. Well, let's go. I just have a question about the picture. Name and address. Okay. Peter, do you, who do I give that to? Just say it. Okay, Peter, it. Peter Batches, 1351 Dooley Lane, here. And uh, my question is, if the tsunami alert would go off, uh, how much time would we have to get to higher ground? You have 20 minutes when the ground starts shaking. Okay. When the alarm, if it goes off, it's not going to, it's not going to work. Those towers are all going to come down in the shaking. The shaking is what tells you get going now. Okay. And you have five minutes of shaking, 15 minutes to move. And you have to move at, I think it's 1.87 miles an hour, depending on where you live. Okay. But that's rule of thumb. Chad, don't you have a map that shows time from... It's called the Tim's map. Yeah, but don't you... Don't you have that map somewhere? That it was used, that map was used to design the evacuation routes as they are right now, and you are exactly right. Um, but the, the sirens, as we're all thinking about Hawaii as well, and the fact that their sirens didn't go off when they were supposed to, I'm not here to comment on that. Um, I have talked to some people in there that thought that the sirens were just for tsunami and their concern was to let them off and people wouldn't know what to do. Who knows what the right decisions in that problem was, but I have taken a few questions like what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. The sirens that we have here are designed to go off uh, primarily for a distant tsunami. So similar to what we had in Japan where we had almost nine hours in advance mm -hmm. to go ahead and start preparing, getting people out, notifying, hit the sirens, get people moving within an hour or two before the tsunami could come in. And that has worked and we've used that. Uh, the other type where that would go off is if we have a full Cascadia River subduction zone uh, uh, earthquake, it's going to be very large and it's going to be very hard to stand. Mm -hmm. Consider that your siren. Sure. The okay. sirens may or may not go off because of, of course, the utilities, the infrastructure, okay. and things like that. Right. And so that one is where you're supposed to start moving around, you know, as soon as you can. As soon as you can. Okay. Um, but we just did a test, I think, today of the sirens. You may have heard some of them. And so the community is asking to put more sirens in. Some communities are removing their sirens. It's kind of complicated, but so far, ours are working. Well. All right. The best thing is to sign up for the, the alerts. Could, is it maybe it's time to put something back out on the blog about where people can go to sign up for the alerts to get them on their phone and well, their computers? That raises a good question. When we were recently in uh, Wisconsin, there was a tornado uh, alert that came through a warning, and her phone right away went off as well as we heard the siren. Uh, you know, so it, it alerted us to get down in the basement and take shelter. But is it possible to have an app that uh, we would be alerted? You know, that's just I shut my phone off and that she does it. So exactly what uh, Councilor Dan was talking okay. about is the Classic Alerts app is one that you can sign up for and then through text, phone calls, and things like that. Now, phone calls it takes a long time to make twenty thousand phone calls. Um, what you're talking about that happened in Wisconsin is called push notification. And it's a system that is already installed here so that anybody with a cell phone and that is turned on, no matter where they are from, will receive a notification or an alert. And you'll see those in Amber Alerts, right? Same thing that you get occasionally on your phones. Yep. But for here, it might be, uh, well, forbid a wildfire or sure. uh, any other kind of climate that you ever come up with. Okay. Good. That's good to know. I wasn't aware of that one too. Thank you, Mary. Yeah. Okay, so let's, anybody else? Because otherwise I'll read the disclaimer. And If not, we'll go to the written communication. Everyone saw that. Anyone have any questions over the written communications? 
And that includes, if I were mayor, now, <laughs> if I were mayor, and one of the first things it says that takes a lot of time. So if you want to come by the office and pick up a copy of this, it's for children in elementary school and high school, $500 first place for three different, it's a uh, take a photo, essays and digital media presentations. And you Mr. Can Mayor, can I chime in on this? Oh, please do. <laughs> <laughs> you have a couple of emails from uh, the city of Cannon Beach and the city of Seaside. Their mayors actually did this contest last year, and they're looking to collaborate with you on it. So because all of the schools are at one location now, so potentially um, everyone collect the entries, but then you all get together and narrow it down to um, a local winner, and then that winner would be submitted to the state contest. Great. Okay. So are you saying I should look at my emails? I would love that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll come back in tomorrow and talk to you. Sounds good. All right. Thanks a lot for that. Can I ask one? Yes, you can. Um, this letter from Abby Wo Roller. Rollier. Were you surprised about that, or? Uh, which one is this? The uh, green, green power. power? A little bit. I was a little bit surprised. It seems like there's a couple of different things going on. Um, it, it seems like, so this, this, and I don't have all the details straight here, and Christy will probably have to help me out. Thank goodness she's listening. But we have the EPA uh, side of things, and then we also have the Pacific Corp Green Power mm -hmm. side of things. We signed up for the Pacific Park Green Power we would buy a certain amount of electricity from them uh, in order to be considered green. And it's a little bit more expensive for that electricity so there's more solar and all that. The other is the EPA side of things. And what they're looking for is communities that are adding things such as solar power uh, and, and that. Um, Your heart does not have a lot of solar power alternative energy. Uh, and in fact, we don't really have anything, to tell you the truth. Uh, we even attempted to go for a grant from the state of Oregon for our emergency services to go with solar power and all that. And they actually recommended and said that it wouldn't be awarded if we did that because it wasn't the, their plan for the communities where they wanted uh, more uh, generators fuel because they could rely on those a little bit better, especially for the projects we're doing. Long story short is that uh, as a community, we are not providing a lot of solar. And if we did more, we would be able to uh, be a part of that program. Um, I think that there is a future for this with when we redo various buildings and things and working with the Energy Trust of Oregon, there's a lot of great incentives and that could be, and that was part of the fire station conversation as well. That has to be built in on newer, um, uh, newer buildings, but currently we don't have any projects um, for solar power that we have. Uh, are, are we still members of the Pacific Power? Power? Chris, is that still true? Are we still in with the uh, that isn't the way I read the court? You have the blue sky renewable energy um, purchase chart in the correspondence. You'll have to decide which column you want to proceed with, basically. So in order to stay in with that program, they want us to buy more of that electricity that is more expensive. Right. And we have not considered that at all. So we should put that on an agenda item or on the work session? This is something that the customers often do, the program. And the city right. as well, uh, with our water treatment facility is what they're but, looking for. But the, the city of Gerhardt could put this out to the public and say, you know, do we want to try to look into this category but, or this. But every single bill you get from PPNL, it has the same stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but so, yeah, the, the, the community so. actually already meets the threshold. Um, it's just the citywide facilities that are just short for the EPA designation. Can we talk? Maybe talk about this more in the future. Yes, we can. Yes. Let's put on it uh, as the, the mayor was saying, future agenda item. I get some more information and talk about some of the ideas you have. Yeah. All right, we'll move on. 
we have no late written correspondence. We have no new ordinance or resolutions, no old business. We only have new business. Mr. Mayor, not... I'm sorry, I'm so talkative tonight. Um, you guys did have some late correspondence. There was a, a report from DLCD on your desk. Oh, yeah. The land Here use. Yes, an informational yes. report on some of the changes to the bills that are coming up. So for, oh, you, for gosh sakes, I just I don't think it's anything that you have to uh, accomplish today, but it is in the piece. Thank you. All right. It's informational. Informational. Okay. All right. So now we've taken care of all that new business, the police department reserve fund request. There is a three minute offer for anyone who wishes to speak about that. Nobody? Then I will call on Chief Gregory to come up and tell us what he wants. I think there's a, I think there's a typo here on the first line. There's an extra zero. No, oh, there is. There is. It was supposed to be a We're asking for $180,000. Yeah, I'll give it a shot. I'll get a real quick answer. We'll have to do a call for that. That's fine. Uh, I'll make this as brief as possible. I got plenty of uh, talking points on it if you'd like to go more in depth. Um, when I came here, I looked, took a look at the patrol vehicles. There were several things that stood out to me, um, not only as a, just a, a my, these are not minor issues, these are a lot of these are officer safety issues. And it's very important to me that our officers go home safe to their families after the shift. While we can't control everything, we can't control certain things. You know, predictable ones for them, right? So one of the items was the front eight pillar spotlight. Um, it's very common, most patrol vehicles have a spotlight located in the front. The officer can turn it, spot it, you know, use that beam to look at area checks. Um, even more importantly, traffic stops, to be able to see into vehicles and light, illuminate the inside of the vehicle. So for our safety, we can see what we're walking up on. Uh, the other is an in cap overhead LED light. And what this light provides is not a bright, it does provide a white light, but it also provides a red LED. And what that does is it, it's a dimmer light for the officer's eyes to adjust quickly. If something occurs outside the vehicle, they can deal with it and they don't have to adjust to the bright light and the light nighttime conditions. What's also as important is it doesn't illuminate the cab of the vehicle as much. So if someone has nefarious ideas or there's something they're looking to do, they can't really see what's going on in the vehicle as well as they would if, if there was this bright light. Um, an overhead emergency light bar. I, I understand uh, the idea that a lot of agencies come up with to not have an overhead light bar. They want a slick top is what it's called. That's, and there, there are a lot of agencies that do that. Um, we want to be visible. My number one goal is we're, you know, we're a very small department, so I want to make sure they see us. I've actually been uh, in conversation with several people in the community who said that they couldn't even see me on a traffic stop until they got out of the Um, It's very common, and I've, Jeremiah was like, oh my goodness, you're not kidding. When we're trying to stop cars or I'm responding code with my lights and sirens, people don't see me because the highest lights on our vehicle are below our side mirrors. So we have to put ourselves in an offset position to get their attention, which is dangerous for us, right? Because they don't see us. If they saw us and moved over, that's fine. We make that happen, and then guess what? We get to the next car, they don't see us. And so it puts us in a bad situation. Uh, the last thing I'm requesting is a, a Python dual KA band radar. Our radar systems, I talked with uh, Sergeant Brown, they've been in service for around 15 years. And I'm not one to get rid of something just because of age, trust me. I looked into it and tried to find ways to upfit ours uh, by adding a rear radar, which is very important. And I can tell you why, uh, if you'd like to hear it. But the system needs to be updated. Uh, they don't operate well. Even him has said that they don't work as well as they did five years ago. So it's just time to get better radar so we can run safer traffic stops and, and get more accurate readings and things of that nature. Quickly. I did make two uh, bids. I found two, two businesses and they, uh, to, to bid from, from vendors. Uh, one was Day Wireless, uh, which is highly recommended. They have a great service and they, they offer a lot in this county. The other is Lear, 
which is another great company as well. Both are based out of Salem. Uh, Dave Wireless provided me a quote for all three vehicles. Now these items done at $17,816.50. They're provided $20,674.31. So close to a $3,000 difference to go with Dave Wireless, which is my proposed uh, vendor. Any questions? Appreciate your consideration. Thank you, Chief. Okay. Anyone want to make a motion? I move that we uh, that we approve the day purchase. Move to allocate the uh, eighteen thousand up to eighteen thousand up to eighteen thousand. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay, discussion. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Unanimous, Justine. Thank you, Thank you, Chief. Anytime you have concerns about safety of you or your men, come to us. Yes, sir. Council concerns, Preston. None. Rita. I have none. Dana. None. Sharon. No. I don't have any. Motion to adjourn. We have motion to adjourn. I'll second that. All those in favor? Aye. 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 I think that's unanimous also, Justine. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for coming out. Again, thank you. Thank you very much.